Reverend Joe Combs and his wife Evangeline are about to go on trial charged with child abuse, kidnapping, and rape. There ought to be something that you care about that you want God to do. A lot of the beatings occurred in here where she would be made to stand in a circle. She said uh, one would beat her until that one got tired and then the other one would start beating her. She was beat with ropes, chains, whips, umbrellas, bats, hammers. Joe and Evangeline Combs were arrested in November of 1998. My dad lived a double life. One of a righteous family man and dynamic speaker in the public eye. But one of sordid sexual secrets privately. Secrets that only my siblings and me and my mom knew. It was, it was craziness. Living one way, preaching another. Lay aside the sin which does so easily beset you. Now that means you can't run the race for God if you've got sin unconfessed in your life. The church deacon says his pastor stole his wife. He lusted after her. He says the pastor controlled his life for years, forcing him to sleep in his basement. The pastor denies it. He has harsh words for the retired deacon. A fellow who would allow an outsider to send him to the basement to be a wimp. Thy deacon's wife. We'll just pretend about Fine. it. Fine. This is the boomerang. Yes. We can't see you back here. What? We can't see you. It's too short. We can't see you. It's too short. Worth it, isn't it? You look the same. Haven't changed since a while ago. No. Thank you, girls. Yes, sir. Where's everybody been this morning? This is the only group that's come. They don't love you anymore. They deserted you. They love you like we do. They don't love you anymore. 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 They don't Someone's got to be a son of thunder, waiting for the touch of God, the channeling of God. Thunder, waiting for the touch of God. Oh, that hurts! Oh, oh God, I'm so tired! Oh God, I, I didn't want to lose her! Oh God, I, I didn't want to have that pain! Oh God, I didn't want to have that pain! Oh God, no, no! Oh God, I'm so tired! Oh God, I, I didn't want to lose her! Oh God, I, I didn't want to have that pain! Oh God, no, no! Oh, oh. God, you love me so much, don't you? Yes. It is a 12-year prison sentence for the former pastor of a Northwest Indiana church, Jack Scopp admitted he had a sexual relationship with an underage girl. I'm Bob Gray. I'm in Italy, Texas. I happen to be at the monument that was erected in Dr. Heil's hometown in his memory. I gotta tell you, the money part of it was pretty nice. As a kid, I mean, think about it. Tithes and offerings from 50,000 people? Hello? <laughs> it created a lavish lifestyle for our family. My father owned most of the city <laughs> where the church was. He owned a college, two high schools, two grade schools, a cemetery, lots of buildings. He was very wealthy. And even into our adult years, he owned us. He owned our homes, our cars, our furniture. He owned our lives. And we didn't dare cross him because we were too afraid we'd lose everything. He died a multimillionaire. He left nothing to his children. He left everything to the organization. I'm 73 years old right now. You'd be amazed what's going on. I'm right in the middle of a $4 million building program. I'm about, I, I just
just bought a, a, a charismatic church. I just bought a hotel. I just bought a vacant lot. Our church is about to enter into a four million dollar building program. I'm about to start two more schools. I don't know what they are. I just want to start a couple of schools. That's all. I don't know what they are, but bless God, at seventy three, I've never been as happy. I've never enjoyed preaching as much as I enjoy it now. You could have chosen a college. <coughs> Many, many things we do not have. We have no government support. We have no denominational support. All we do is barely pay the bills. And I came, I came across that two syllable word, money. I like that, you know. And then I came across those three syllable words because I said, I'm going to have to better my education if I run around Dr. Jack Howells. It's the three syllables. And I liked it. I got a check one day that says, deal by the end college here, the student body sitting before you here, the staff and faculty administrators and a few friends around the country have pooled their resources in the last few days have raised $70,000 for your 70th birthday. <laughs> Students, those are three armed guards. Don't you try to touch that money. Uh, we have a wheelbarrow full of cash for you. Bring it right on up here. That is $70,000 of real cash. Howells Anderson College, I often say, is not a college, it's an army. Our students are not students, they're soldiers. Our faculty is not a faculty, they're sergeants and trainers. Training an army to reach America with the gospel of Christ and to save our country. That isn't all. Howells Anderson College is not only an army, it's a family. I'm not the chancellor, I'm the father. 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 All right, today I want to talk to you about Jack Hiles the legacy of Jack Hiles and um, just some things I have discovered the Lord showed me about Jack Hiles and the whole ministry of First Baptist Church of Hammond as well as Hiles Anderson College uh, if you've seen the introduction to this video you know there's some very controversial things the little video that I played there at the beginning I'm sure is quite shocking to a lot of people and uh, if you've gone through that system if you were out there at Hiles Anderson College or First Baptist Church, I'm sure you're aware of a lot of what was going on. And of course, I'm also uh, realizing that there's probably going, to, probably going to be a lot of people that follow Jack Hiles um, and that don't dare question anything that the man ever said or put out. And you're probably very offended and probably saying I'm not saved and not a good Baptist or something like this. Well, let me just say this at the very outset of this video. Um, I'm not a Baptist. Okay, now doctrinally I hold to some of the same doctrinal stands as the Independent Fundamental Baptists. I do believe that the King James Bible is God's perfect word. I don't believe it uh, should be corrected or updated or anything else. I believe that this book right here is God's perfect book for the English speaking world. I think that you can make translations of the received text and if they're comparable to the Textus Receptus and, and the King James and other languages, I think that that's fine too. Okay, 
I'm not saying that there's only one language that you can have the Bible in. I don't believe that. All right. But let me just say one other thing here. Another, well, a couple other things actually. Um, you say, what's the purpose of this video? Why would you put together a video like this? Because Jack Hiles died in 2001. So why would I, you know, come out and slander the memory of a dead man? Well, because the legacy that the man left is still very much um, in power, um, still very, very active. And um, there's another reason I'm doing this. And that is because while I don't call myself a Baptist, um, a lot of what Jack Hiles stood up for are stands that I take in this ministry. And you see, we, we are really good. Bible-believing Christians are very good at pointing out the errors of cults and things like that. But a lot of times uh, there's a deaf ear turned, you know, when some of that corruption starts to come from within our own professing ranks. And I say professing because I think Jack Hiles was a lot more wicked of a man um, than most people realize. And I'm going to be showing you that in, that, in this study. But um, I think it's very important that Bible-believing Christians, King James Bible believers, whether you call yourself a Baptist or not, whatever, I think it's very important that we come out and we expose those within our own ranks that are preaching very heretical things and doing things that are very wicked, very sinful, that have been covered up. I think it's very important for us to, to do a little bit of house cleaning. Okay, That's why I'm doing this study. And there's also another reason why I'm doing this study, which is probably the most important reason, certainly my biggest motivation, and that is the fact that there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, up into the millions of people that have been led into a false profession of faith through the Jack Hiles cult and the following that he has inspired. Um, they preach a, a gospel with no repentance. And I've been preaching against that thing now for years and years and years. And a lot of people misunderstand what I, my stand that I take on it. They say I preach salvation by works. I do not. I preach that you have to come to God as a sinner. Okay? That's what I preach. What is the purpose of you getting saved? Also, I can go to heaven when I die. Okay, well, why would you be going to hell? You know? See, a lot of people don't come to the Lord in a broken state. They just go and they say this prayer. They're pushed into it. We're going to see that in this study today. And they're coming out and, they're, and there's no change. There's nothing. And you can look it up here on YouTube. I saw two women that were raised at First Baptist Church and Hiles Anderson College. They went there and things. Now they're atheists. They hate God. Why would that be? Well, because they were led into a false sense of salvation. And, you know, one of the statistics here, I'm going to show you in, the, in this documentation, one of the statistics put out by Russell Anderson, I think it was by him, uh, it's, it said that there were over 10 million souls saved by this Hiles cult, his following. 10 million souls saved. False professions of salvation, and what happens is you go and you're and you're trying to live like a holy person, and you start having all kinds of problems and trouble, and after a while you just say, "Forget this, I'm leaving this. See ya. I don't even believe in God anymore." And then you go to and you try to witness to somebody like that, and they say, "Oh yeah, I've done all that stuff. Yeah, I used to be King James only. Yeah, you know, women will say, yeah, I used to be forced to dress in modest apparel and." I used to this, and I used to have long hair, and I used to this, and all these other standards that do appear in Scripture, you know? But you see, a real Satanist, a real minister of Satan, would come out and actually get so close to what the Bible teaches, and yet just twist salvation just a little tiny bit, so that he could be sure that he would damn people into the millions. And that's exactly what Jack Hiles did. So I want to show you, and by the way, people still worship him too. I just I have that written here. That's another big thing. I'm going to show you two different types of documentation. Okay, Some of it you've already seen. Some of it you've seen the videos that were at the beginning. And I'm going to show you the longer clips of those. Um, some of it, I'm not going to show some all of that stuff on there uh, just for sake of time and, and, 
you know, decency to the the thing of Jack Scott, and he's doing the the sermon on a polished shaft. Uh, I really don't need to show any more than that, you know, of that video there. I, it's that's enough, you know. Just just you say, well, why did you even put that in the video, Brian? Well, very simple, because it just shows the level of discernment that is out there at First Baptist Church. The discernment there that you can have a bunch of men sitting behind him there, deacons and whatever else, and they're just sitting there going. Just watching. Uh, shouldn't somebody have gotten up and said, uh, um, excuse me, uh, brother, uh, we need to stop this. This is wrong. Uh, we, this, this has to be over. Oh, no. See, they can't do that because it's a cult, and you can't dare question the man of God that's up there preaching. I was in a service the one time where a guy was starting to get a little bit leaning towards perversion, with what he was saying. And at that time, myself and another one of the elders there, we stopped the service in a house church setting. We said, okay, uh, hold on a second. And we took the, the brother outside and we talked to him. And we said, you're not going to finish this sermon. You're heading towards the level of perversion. That's what should have been done there. But you see, they set up a hierarchical structure in these Baptist cults, and not all Baptist groups do this, but I'm saying the, the big ones like the Hiles Anderson thing, when you get 50,000 people going to some place, you got a cult. All right, they're worshiping the man, which we're going to see from their own people, their own people there. We're going to see that they do worship Jack Hiles. But, you know, this whole thing, you get this guy there and you can't question him and you don't dare say anything and stuff like that. I wonder if that uh, teenage girl that was uh, essentially molested, you know, by Jack Scapp, I wonder if that would have happened if some of those men would have had the guts to stand up and say, hey, whoa, wait, this is wrong. We have to stop this. But nothing was said. And it wasn't just a new thing with Jack Scapp either. It was going on for a long time. Now, let me just give you a little bit of history here before we get into this study. Um, how did I come to do this study? Well... Uh, back years and years ago, right around the time King James Video Ministries was just starting to get st its, its start, uh, I think it was right around um, 2007, 2008, somewhere in there, I was going to a Hiles Anderson style church, okay, Liberty Baptist Church in uh, Ephrata slash Lincoln, it's right on the border there, of Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, the, the county where I grew up. And... At this church, they, at one point in time, it was huge. It, well, not as big as Jack Hiles' cult, but uh, it had 900 members in regular attendance, okay? And Jack Hiles actually came and spoke there the one time. And I had an opportunity to, uh, actually a couple, on a number of occasions, to actually preach from that pulpit. And I was told that Jack Hiles actually had preached from that pulpit, along with Jerry Falwell, another time he had been there, Jerry Falwell and Jack Hiles. And I remember at the time, I thought that was a great honor to be able to preach in the same pulpit where Jack Hiles once stood. See, I fell for it too. I heard a few sermons from Jack Hiles and I, I got caught up in the charismatic delivery and the, the very stage acting carnival type of a voice that the man puts on. And um, I have a sermon on that, carnival preaching. You can hear that if you look it up go to my channel, you can just type it into the search thing, Carnival, just right in that, and you'll, you'll find it. But the fact of the matter is, I got caught up in some of that stuff. So I came into the thing thinking Jack Hiles was one of the heroes of the faith. I really had no, no reason to question the man or think that he was a bad man or whatever else. But as I started getting more and more into ministry, I started running more and more into this thing of not just guys saying, here's salvation and not talking about repentance, but actually coming out and attacking those of us who preach repentance to salvation. Those of us who say, preach the new birth, where somebody has to be born again. There has to be a changed life as evidence of a true conversion, you know, um, after salvation, by the way, okay? Because Lordship salvation, I'll repeat it one more time, Lordship salvation is you clean up your life before you get saved and then God gives you, grants you repentance and then you get belief and then you're saved. That is heresy. I don't teach that. 
I teach that you have to understand, a sinner can understand that they're a sinner. According to the Word of God, their conscience also bearing them witness, talks about in the Bible. And they can understand that they're a sinner. And they can understand, if I become a Christian, I don't know how I'm going to change all this stuff, but things are going to change in my life. My buddies aren't going to get along you know, with me very well anymore, and people are going to make fun of me, and, and I could lose my job, and whatever else. And, and, you know, people in other countries understand this. It's usually just, you know, the people in America especially, but the UK and, and some of the other places where people are so wicked and just, you know, whatever, that you have people complaining about this. You get somebody in, in Pakistan or North Korea or someplace like that, and you say, salvation is going to mean a changed life. They're going to be like, well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> you know, but I started to run into this easy believism thing where, you pray a prayer and you're in. And anybody can pray the prayer. There's no change required. You just, you pray the prayer, you're a saved Christian now. And, you know, I've run into these heretics before and, and I've been dealing with them now for years. And I did some research and I thought, you know, where is this easy believism thing coming from? And that led me to David Cloud's website. And now if you've seen my video on the uh, House Church book right back here, Here's my copy of the House Church Movement. I did rip on David Cloud. I think that he's got some very serious heresies that he talks about in that book right there. So I'm not a 100% uh, in agreement with David Cloud. But I will say this. He discusses this issue of the easy believism thing and he points it right back to Jack Hiles. Here's another book of his. Okay, and I'm going to be showing you some things from this book. But in this book here... He gets into the teachings of Jack Hiles and the fact that Jack Hiles was very much against the thing of repentance. And he just was into this thing of just belief. And, and Jack Hiles, his main thrust of his life was numbers. We have the largest Sunday school in the world. We have the largest Baptist church in the world. We have the largest number of people in regular attendance. We have the largest, we have the largest, we have the largest. And if you saw there in the introduction, he's bragging about, you know, buying all of these things and, and whatever else. And he died with $70 million worth of real estate left behind. Hmm. Interesting. So how do you get a lot of numbers? By telling people that uh, there needs to be repentance involved with their salvation? Or by just going out and telling people, pray this prayer, and then you just kind of do a quick head count, and you go, oh, okay, we had 700 people saved. You say, well, Brian, you know, that, that didn't really happen. Oh, yeah, it did. I'm going to read that to you later. But, uh, so, I, you know, I started to hear some things about Jack Hiles, and I started to think, well, it's obviously that, you know, these people are just jealous of Jack Hiles, and, and they're going to start... You know, they're, they're attacking him because the devil's getting him to attack and everything else. And, but I thought, you know, I'm just going to be objective and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to answer the matter before I hear it. And I'm going to start to look into this thing. And that's what I did. And a lot of the evidence and things, um, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to include a lot of this stuff because I just don't think that they have enough support behind it. The majority of what I've found against Jack Hiles actually comes from their own material. The, their, the things that they put out themselves. Not exposés against Jack Hiles. Although I will be you know, referring to some of that. But that's not where I get the majority of my information. Just going to Jack Hiles' own videos that they put out. And the facts that have been come out from them tells me that the Hiles cult is very, very satanic. Okay, you say, well, Brian, you say a lot of things are satanic. Yeah, the devil's pretty busy here in these last days. Very busy. So let me begin here. We're going to look at some things on my uh, over-the-head camera here. I guess we'll start out first with the David Cloud book. Here we have The Hiles Effect, A Spreading Blight by David Cloud. This is available for free, by the way, on, on, uh, online. Here's a statement that Jack Hiles would often make. He'd say, close your Bibles and listen to me. 
That's real good. Uh, this is talking about Scap, and he said that uh, he wasn't really, you know, uh, just kind of a chance encounter or whatever with this young girl that he, you know, fornicated with. Here it says the reality is that he had time to exchange 637 text messages and 25 phone calls with the girl in a one month period from June 21st to Ju July 21st, 2012. The reality is that the megachurch pastor wickedly preyed on the youth and vulnerability of a troubled young church member. Okay. Down here, it talks about um, uh, the, the First Baptist in his book, Marriage of the Divine Intimacy. He says about, note the following excerpt. You can read this whole thing here. I'm not going to read it all, but he talks about the Lord's Supper being like spiritual intercourse. Again, this thing's printed there by the First Baptist Church, Hiles Anderson, that whole cult there. Shouldn't somebody have seen some red flags go up when they saw that? You would think so. Uh, just kind of going through here. Not going to read all the stuff I have highlighted. You can get this. Like I said, this is available online for free. You can go to his website and... Um, read it for yourself just highlighting some of the stuff here um, some of it I agree with some of it I don't agree with you know, here again we have the fruit of Hylesism and this is what I agree with here being the products of shallow evangelism many of these have never been public or biblically converted they have prayed a sinner's prayer but haven't been born again Exactly true. That's the case with a lot of day of uh, modern day Christians. You know, I think this is interesting here. Jack Hiles part here. We have page twenty one. He says uh, about people that are going against Jack Hiles. Their motives have been questioned. Their ministries have been blacklisted kind of like what uh, Steven Anderson does with his ridiculous little repentance blacklist website uh, biblical shallowness one could sit under his ministry for years and remain biblically illiterate which uh, better allowed him to control people's thinking and pursue an unscriptural pattern of ministry uh, down here I personally heard Hiles preach messages based on one verse used as a mere pretext. I personally heard him say, close your Bibles, just listen to me, in sermons he preached in the 1970s. Oftentimes he would say, you don't need to open your Bibles, just listen to me. Yeah, I heard him too. I listened to some of Hiles' stuff, and he will go off, and he'll get, the, he'll get the crowd, you know, I don't even want to call him a congregation. He'll get the crowd involved, and it'll be very exciting and everything else. I mean, listen to some of this stuff and count the number of verses that he's actually reading. Very, very few. Cults don't build up their people to be strong in God's Word. Very true. Cults use the Bible but only as a source of proof texts for their heresies and to browbeat the people into submission and to motivate them to work hard to build up the cult empire. Very, very true. Um, like I said, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I just, there's a couple things I wanted to get to here. I don't really have, you know, anything listed, in, you know, notes and stuff, which pages to go to and whatever else. I'm just going to scan through it here quick. Okay. Here you have, this is interesting. Consider the following rules that were required of Hiles Anderson College students under Hiles regime. I don't know if they still are. These were handed out every year in work scholarship meetings for the Dean of Women, and a copy was given to me in 2000 by a student who graduated from there in 1989, and today is the wife of a pastor. Loyalty to leadership, Hiles Anderson College. Number one, always think the leader is right. Never give your opinion when the leader feels strongly. Uh, and then it goes down. He's not giving them all here. But number four, don't correct the leader any time. 
the people are better off hearing a wrong answer than to see the leader put down by a follower. I look at it as a put down when a leader is corrected. Number eight, always do anything the leader asks, whether it is right or not. Why? A, I trust him to not ask me to do something immoral or sinful. B, if I do something I think will hurt someone, it is him who is responsible to God for it. Nice. Uh, number 15, never say anything negative about the leader, not even a joke. And he says, this is cultic, or that is cultic. Yeah, and it is. It's very, very bad. Here, I'll show this. I'm going to show this later on. This woman here, the organ player, Elaine Colston, made the following idolatrous statement. She says, quote, As an organist, I cannot separate the two. God and my pastor. My pastor represents my Lord. And you're going to see that at the memorial service. They actually are saying the same thing. They're comparing Jack Hiles with God and with Jesus Christ. Incredible. Um... <clears throat> Jack Hiles boasted here, he says, quote, This is the greatest church in the history of Christianity. We must, we must protect it at all costs. Without us, America is gone. We'll see. Funny because when the, the Hiles cult out there was really in its heyday, American morality and everything was falling apart. Hmm. Thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, Dr. Don Boyce says here, I have observed a cover-up mentality in many large Baptist churches that seems to be systematic. You see, let me just say this real quickly before I continue. The reason that there's a problem in a lot of Baptist churches is because uh, the Baptists are in these buildings that have no basis in Scripture. They have a phallic symbol on top, the steeple. You can watch my study on the independent fundamental Baptist Catholicism to see the documentation on that. But they have this, they're basically in a pagan temple with a phallic symbol on top, an obelisk, essentially a stylized obelisk. And it's drawing all kinds of weird spirits into that building there. And as a result, there's all kinds of trouble. Excuse me. Not to mention the fact that there's a lot of inappropriate situations that you get put into in those places. You know, a lot of late hours working there and things like that. And all of a sudden there's some other guy's wife there and she's helping you out in this thing here. And you got to teach a Sunday school and you got to get this woman here to help you or whatever. There's all kinds of trouble. The pastors in these places, you know, a lot of times they're counseling women that are coming to them and they're having marital problems and they start to talk about intimacy and, the, you know, just incredible. Uh, page 61 here, he says, Immorality has been absolutely rife among members of First Baptist Church and graduates of Hiles Anderson. Rife. I have preached in more than 550 churches in every straight state of the Union except Hawaii and in 12 other countries, and everywhere I have traveled I have learned about fallen men who are associated closely with First Baptist and Hiles Anderson College. And we're going to see some proof of that later on. I'm going to show you that. I thought this was an interesting statement here. Page 67, he says, The Hiles circle of IFB or IF Baptists has been as shockingly rife with immorality as the Roman Catholic priesthood. And we're going to see later that there is a tie in. Something is said about a certain group within Catholicism. I don't want to name any names or anything. Not yet. And, uh, <clears throat> and Jack Scapp is present, and it's just like, oh, well, praise the Lord. You know. You have to stay tuned. You'll see it later. Um, down here it says about uh, in page 71, uh, Hiles Youth Conference Promotion 1992. You can read some of this stuff here. But uh, a few years ago we saw the church disgraced by resorting to circus-style swallowing of goldfish to draw a crowd. Next, the church was disgraced by using the lottery giveaway gimmick to buy a crowd. I have a brother that wrote to me and said that he was part of some of that nonsense the one year. And uh, interestingly, though, the very first Baptist church in America, the oldest one, built in 1700, was actually financed by a state lottery. Not much has changed among the Baptist movement, I guess, at least in terms of the uh, 
Babel buildings. Uh, you know, another good point here, page 77, it says, Thus, after allegedly winning a million or so people to Christ, the church's faithful members, the true core of the church, can be counted in the hundreds. That is quick prayerism. Absolutely. I mean, if you've led millions of people to the Lord, you know, we've led a million people to the Lord, whatever, you've done that, where are they? What are their names? We're going to see that later on in the video section. Mm. Yeah, here's another good one. An effective, quick prayerism soul winner banks, perhaps unconsciously, on the fact that a lot of people are polite and can be manipulated into praying a prayer. You know, here's talking about a thousand decision cards. Not even one was interested in the things of Christ. And again, there's nothing that you can do that, that is more deadly and more destructive to somebody's soul than to get them to pray a quick prayer. Now, I've run into those people. You know, you talk to them and you say, are you saved? And they say, well, yeah, I think I'm saved. And you say, well, how do you know? I prayed a prayer. And you look at their life, you talk to them and things like that, and they're not saved. You know? They had no desire for the Bible, no desire for the things of the Lord. Just incredible. Oh, excuse me. Rough night of sleep. <laughs> so, try not to yawn too much here. Uh, he gets into Jack's scap. Just going to kind of zip through this here. And towards the end here, David Cloud gets into, he gets into uh, some of the, the letters and things that were sent, you know, talking about the whole Jack Hiles thing, which we'll be talking about here as we continue. Uh, I think that's about it for this book that I'm going to talk about. Um, there's, there's a lot of things in here that we could go over, but it just, it's just crazy. Uh, some of this stuff. Anyhow, if you want to read the book, like I said, I don't want to. I don't want to go through a whole lot of it. And you know, I'm not endorsing David Cloud's ministry just across the board. Everything he does is fine. No, his House Church Movement book there was just ridiculous. It was nonsense. But uh, this thing here, it's it's okay. But uh, I'm going to get into some of these written articles here now. And some of this stuff I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, just let me tell you why. Here we have the Biblical Evangelist, and this is by Robert Sumner. Robert Sumner is not a Bible believer, and uh, it goes down. It's 26 pages long, and I printed it because there was some interesting information in it. I'll just show you a little bit of this. Uh, let's see if I can find some of the stuff I highlighted. But, you know... It, a lot of the sources that he quotes, it's just like, well, Jack Hiles preached a, a sermon early on in uh, early on in 1988 or something. What's the name of the sermon? About how far into it does he say what he's saying? You don't get that information. So, a lot of the information is kind of a little bit sketchy, and I don't really trust somebody that doesn't believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word. Now, something that you'll discover if you study this whole issue is the fact that Jack Hiles' son, David Hiles, was a perpetual fornicator. Um, he was just extremely, extremely wicked and just did some things that were really bad. And I read this from a few sources, actually, so um, I'll just show you this just to, just to kind of, you know, show you some of what Jack Hiles' son was doing. Zoom in here. It says here about parents went to him with letters. Dave had written their daughters containing obscene and immoral content. He would read, reach for the letters and say, I'll take care of it. But the only thing taken care of was the evidence which was the parents no longer had in their possession. So Jack Hiles was destroying the evidence against his son. And he would ship him over to this church to preach and then in, you know, to another one to preach, covering up for his sin. Seems kind of weird. It says here, in a short time, Dave became involved with a number of women at Miller Road, and the whole thing blew sky high. 
Young Hiles had foolishly put a large number of pictures of women and himself, sans clothing, in other words, without anything on, some members, some not, in a suitcase, then put the valise in the dumpster behind the church. It was a nice-looking, fairly new suitcase, and the janitor's son spotted it while he was playing around the trash. He helped himself, as kids are prone to do, but since it was locked, he took it to his father, who managed to get it open. What a shock. The janitor, in turn, took the pictures to a couple of the deacons, who met privately with Dave before ta it, taking it to anyone else. The chairman of the board called a meeting to discuss it with all the deacons, and eventually the board unanimously asked for Hiles' resignation. There was not even one dissenting vote. Hiles then abandoned his wife and children, going to Illinois with another man's wife, one of the women he had been involved with, living together without the benefit of clergy, you know, whatever. A child was conceived, and eventually the couple married. At one time, uh, with reference to Miller Road, Dave had made arrangements to come back to the church and apologize, confessing all of his sin, but on the scheduled night, just a few minutes before he was to leave for the church, he received a call telling him not to confess. He didn't. And, you know, you can study more on that whole thing, too. I'm just trying to see if there's anything else I want to read from this article. Uh, now I'm going to quit on this one. But, you know, if you want to go and read the article, if you're, like, really curious about it or whatever else, there you go, biblicalevangelist.org, and there's the rest of the thing that you can go to. I'm not going to put links in the study here or whatever else, because this stuff, you know, you can find it online, and uh, I'll show you the links and, and things, and I'm going to be showing the video documentation later on. I'll tell you which ones I'm going to be referring to. So that's how we're going to do that. Um, now, let me see here. What should I, I'm trying to see which one I should cover next. Okay, here's another one. Um, this is David Cloud's website. Let me show you here. Wayoflife.org. You can just go there and you can find this. The Women Who Knew Jack Hiles. And uh, this is a, I have eight pages here of testimony of d different women. And um, I'm going to be showing this in the video portion of this study that uh, one of the deacons that Jack Hiles had working for him there at First Baptist Church uh, was a na man named Vic Nishik. Okay, and Vic, ha his wife, Jenny, uh, was Hiles' secretary. And they started to have a, a relationship together. And a uh, big involved story. You're going to see the video a little, a little bit later about this whole thing. But basically, Hiles ruined their marriage. And um, either way you want to look at it, too, by the way, even if you say, well, he didn't even touch her or whatever, he still ruined their marriage. And, um, you know, just really, really sordid affair there. And there's a number of these women... Uh, there's Jenny Nishik's daughter, uh, Judy, I think her name is, Judy Nishik, and uh, I think, forget who the other one was, but then Jack Hiles' own daughter, Linda. You saw her at the beginning, Linda Murphy. She actually has come out against her own father now and said, yeah, he was, he was crooked. Pretty strong uh, witnesses there. The Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. But let me show you here an email that I received. I'm not going to give the brother's name. Uh, but it, this was an email sent to me. And uh, talks about grading there and, and everything else. But down here it says, To entice people we offered prizes, including a grand prize of a used TV. Huh? And money. <laughs> kind of a weird thing, you know, to get people to come out to a meeting. You say, we're going to give you, you know, the possibility of winning money and a used television. You know, most Bible believers I know take stands against television. Why are you giving one out? Kind of interesting. Why? Well, because Jack Hiles would do whatever it takes to get people into his Babel building there. When the invitation time came, it says here, the preacher asked if anyone wanted to trust Jesus as their Savior and asked for a raise of hands. A quick count was made and estimated since it was impossible to get an accurate count. 
Our group ended up reporting 700 salvations for this day. So that's what these guys would do. They do this quick prayerism thing and then they count and just kind of get a rough estimate there. I think it's about 700, you know. Of course, you have to estimate up. And so what happened is, um, let me show you here some photographs that this brother sent to me right after this whole event where they were giving out you know, money and used television and they reported that they had 700 souls saved. Uh, this flyer came out here in the Sword of the Lord publication and uh, the most unique pastor's school ever. It says, you can see it there. And it says, recently on our church's 100th birthday, we had over 125,000 to attend Sunday school and over 18,000 walked an aisle, were dealt with personally. Uh, not at all true. That was a lie. You know, it just, I mean, you know, the thing here, let me, let me show you the email again. Just, it says, I took the article to Brother Stubblefield and held it up to his face and asked him how Jack Hiles could lie like this. I explained how our 700 reported salvations did not walk an aisle or were not dealt with personally and most likely did not even get saved. You say, what happened to this brother? Within a few weeks, I was asked to leave for having too many demerits. <laughs> Kicked him out. And uh, here he's talking about down here, this brother. I mean, you can pause some of this stuff and read it, but this... Um, I don't want to give any personal information out there. So, but uh, this guy's talking about another student. You know, was caught in fornication. Um, you know, but you go to a, a, another church. You know, pastor by Hiles Anderson. Wait here. So fornication off campus is only a three-day suspension, but attending ch another church pastored by Hiles Anderson graduate is calls for dismissal. So, you know, just some of the hypocrisy that goes on there at Hiles Anderson College. This brother, you know, saw this lying that Jack Hiles was doing, you know, promoting his big numberism stuff. Just incredible. But uh, we're going to look at here at two other things. First, we'll go through this list here. List of Hiles related clergy sex abuse cases. It says here former A.V. Bellinger, former FBCH, First Baptist Church of Hammond, deacon convicted for molesting a child. Jack Hiles had the church give him a standing ovation and kept him in the bus ministry. Nice. How about uh, Chris Settlemore? Hiles Anderson graduate convicted for criminal sexual conduct with underage males. Dave Hiles, Hiles Anderson student, former FBCH staff member, former heir to the Hiles throne, never been convicted but attached to numerous scandals, pleaded the Fifth Amendment when questioned about the death of Brent Stevens. You know, so much corruption going on. Jeffrey Jarrell. Hiles Anderson graduate took a guilty plea for molesting 11 girls from his church. Hmm. A tree's known by its fruits. Interesting. Joe Combs, former faculty member at Hiles Anderson College, now serving sentence for multiple counts of violent and sexual child abuse against the woman formerly known as Esther Combs. And we're going to talk, talk about that. We're actually going to watch the video here in, in just a little bit. But... You know, he was the guy that uh, uh, was beating his own daughter with, with whips and chains and all kinds of stuff like this. And he's the head of the Bible department. You say, oh, Brian, you know, or, come on. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Russell, or uh, Joe Combs, the head of the Bible department. Well, here you have Hiles Anderson College on Wikipedia. Scandals. Pastor Joe Combs, Joseph Combs, and his wife Evangeline Lopez Combs were members of the First Baptist Church, 
Baptist Church of Hammond, and Combs was also a professor at Hiles Anderson College, even described as the foremost Bible instructor at Hiles Anderson. One babysitter who was a Hiles Anderson College student testified that she and others suspected Esther was mistreated but didn't want to contradict Combs, who had been their Bible professor at Hiles Anderson College. Another babysitter testified she reported her sus suspicions to the college president, but apparently nothing was done, she said. So, you know, this, this Esther Combs, which we're going to see the video, um, she had 410 scars on her body from the abuse. And that's just, you know, when you think about that, 410 scars, that's what left scars. What about all, all the time she was beaten and it didn't leave scars? Nice system. Over here we have William Beeth, Hiles Anderson graduate charged with solicitation for sex and for exposing himself in public. Back where I was from, Lancaster County, there was a, a Baptist church of Myerstown, Baptist church, and uh, the pastor's son-in-law, a Sunday school teacher, was driving around exposing himself in public. I've talked about that before in other studies. Some weird things. Now this one here, another article. Here you have rapidnet.com. Uh, J. Beard, whatever, exposes how test them, blah, blah. There's the address right there. You can see it. Let me zoom in so you can get a good look at it. Right there. Okay? If you want to go read the article for yourself, you know, otherwise you can just kind of pause this and read it. Down here it talks about, I thought this was interesting. These are all testimonies from former files, yeah, files, Hiles followers. Down here you have the George Godfrey incident when they broke into his house and stole his honorary doctorate from Hiles Anderson College. Hmm. Sounds kind of cultic. And here we have, uh, and you know, they leave out some things for to protect the people's identity, but it says, I am almost so many years old, and having been a Christian for most of those years, I was virtually ignorant of correct theology until three years ago. <laughs> Isn't that something? How many of you have, have gone to Baptist church buildings, you know, years and years and years, and you're almost ignorant of the correct theology until you get online and start to do the research for yourself? Amazing. It says here, and as an Im immature, and as immature a Christian as, as they come. I thank God for ripping me away from the radical beliefs of Jack Hiles' brand of fundamentalism. My husband and I are often amused that, in our opinion, God took us out of church to get us into church. <laughs> I like that. I tremble to think of the times that I stood on people's doorsteps and led them through a meaningless prayer and assured them that there, that's all there is to it. See you in heaven. And then walked away from a person who was as clueless after my visit as they were before Incredible, isn't it? That is easy believism. That's what goes on. Concerning my abusive father in such and such year, my father was, an, was a Hiles Anderson College student and a Sunday school bus driver on a Chicago route. Nice. I know beyond a doubt that many hack graduates and students living in the Hammond area are current wife and children abusers I have friends, friends and former roommates from college who are married to some of these guys. My sister and I saw these girls come to church on Saturday, Sunday morning with bruised faces and bleeding lips, kind of like Esther Combs, and the children often looked worse. What is the deal? Why is the church still covering for these bums? And they still do. You know, and all oh, what they, they asked, you know, for people's forgiveness for what Jack Scapp did and everything. Why don't they bring out the truth about Jack Hiles that we're going to be seeing in this study? Here it says, it is a vicious cycle. First Baptist Church of Hammond is a powerful place. They manipulate people all over the country. And it is because so many people will not open their eyes to what is really going on. And I pray that you do that if you're out there and a member of First Baptist Cult. Down here it says, I did hear, let me just try to zoom in a little bit here so you can see it better. 
I did hear uh, about one preacher's school about two years ago when Jack Hiles had men come on stage wearing dog collars and he wore a robe like the Pope. People would ask the dogs questions and they could only answer when Dr. Hiles yanked their leashes. That's nice. There, down here this person says, my name is whatever and I am one of the whatever of the late Dr. John R. Rice. I can tell you that I have known Jack Hiles my entire life and everything you mentioned in your website is either something that I have seen proof of myself or something I know of. The evil things Jack Hiles did were not known till after Dr. Rice was in heaven or we obviously would have separated from fellowship with him completely. Jack Hiles is a wicked, wicked man. Somebody knew him personally. Down here, I went to Hack for five years and then taught at Miller Road Baptist uh, in Garland for several years. The Hiles family is one of the worst things that has ever happened to Christianity. The doctrines they have taught are nothing more than man-made ideas which confuse and mislead, mislead people after 10 years away from their influence. I am still trying to find out who God really is and what the Bible really teaches. I am convinced they have brainwashed thousands of people and we'll have much to answer for someday. Jack Hiles oftentimes would uh, allow us as female students to sit on his car hood while he drove off slowly after a girls meeting with Daddy Hiles screaming, We love you, preacher, like we saw at the beginning of the video. Like he was some rock star with groupies, he would throw down 10 and $20 bills from the cafeteria balcony at Screaming Girls he would allow the girls to pat his back and touch his garments, so to speak. When he would go to the cafeteria area, a girls' meeting to have, after a girls' meeting to have our free pizza, pizza, when I was in it, I thought it was perfectly normal. It took some years to see the inappropriateness of this hero worship, but at the time, it really met needs for love, excitement, fun, and significance. Okay. Yeah. Here it says it is a personality cult of one man who has complete control of thousands of followers. People start to shut off their thinking when the red flags keep happening. Yep, very true of the Hiles Anderson cult. Here it says, uh, why did I stay in that environment so long? I wish I could tell you. I saw how the ch church treated other families who left and talked about them from the pulpit um, after they left and then shunned them completely, just as we were told to do from the pulpit. Same thing happened to me when I left Liberty Baptist Church. I got shunned. Words cannot express the distorted view of God that a Hiles church can give to a person. Amen. Down here, it says, What I thought was a nightmare from the college days became worse in this Hiles copycat church. We had left devastated and destroyed after being in the U.S. for eight years, still attending a Jack Hiles Pro Church. We finally left because of the pastor's spousal abuse. Interesting. Up here in this letter it says, As to Jack Hiles himself, I attended one of his pastor's schools. I was never so disappointed in all my life. The very first meeting of the conference had him crying out to the crowd, What are you? The reply came back, Idiots. Partly true because they were there. <laughs> you know, here it goes into the thing of, of this guy had a friend that went to the Hiles Anderson cult and um, says here, Some things my friend has said are, Number one, Jack Hiles is the Elijah of this generation and not to be questioned, criticized, or spoken ill of. Nice system there. Number two, God is only working through First Baptist and that church is needed if revival is going to take place in America. We're going to see that later in the video clips. You know, that Jack Hiles is like, well, if we need to restore America and bring back America. Chapter and verse, you know. Number three, Jack Hiles is personally responsibility for my, responsible for my salvation no kidding. He claims if Jack were not around, no Americans today would be saved. He said, I need, needed to thank Hiles for my salvation. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, four here. He says, all churches in America have been touched by Jack Hiles. Not true. Jack Hiles has led more people to the Lord than anyone. Therefore, he is not to be questioned. Hiles' words are final authority. He, he submitted, or admitted that he doesn't care. Compare Hiles' teaching to Scripture as this would be sin. And you're going to see that later at Jack Hiles' 70th birthday party. Something one of the, I guess, students or one of the guys there at the university or whatever, at the college there, what they say. It's unreal. This is interesting too here. This is a, another interesting testimony. It says, I was one of Jack Hiles' personal bodyguards from 1973 to 19, or 78 to 83. If you only knew the actual man, I met with him personally and saw his megalomania and personal greed. I have talked with many of his personal staff and found their stories to be reputable when proclaiming his escapades and sexually perverted techniques or tendencies. Excuse me. Uh, there was one staff member at Hiles Anderson College, a Bill McFadden, who had sex with a student in the chapel tunnel when it was reported this, the in incident was swept under the rug and dismissed. Jack was not going to let this ruin his monarchy. Jack was more like Jimmy Swaggart or, or James Baker than a man of God. I feel most sorry for his son David, who was a victim of his father's debauchery and gutter, gutter life. I worked with David as well. Of course, that's why the son there, David, that's why he messed around with fornication and everything else because of seeing his dad doing it. Down here it says, Jack Hiles was not only wrong on salvation and repentance, he was a Class A fraud. I graduated from his college and seminary in the 1980s. I attended First Baptist Church of Hammond for seven years. I played their game quite well, not knowing any better at the time. I won more souls than anyone in my time there. I was awarded the Sword of the Lord Award for Evangelism in recognition of my numbers. They were in the thousands. I taught soul winning in pastor's school. Jack Hiles would say and do anything to validate his ministry and massive ego. Numbers were all that mattered to him. I've seen buses full of black children who will not being allowed in the bus ministry were driven down the, the alley behind the church, told to repeat a prayer and counted as souls won on church property during big days. It was a disgraceful practice. In all my years in Hiles' church, I was never able to find one person whom Jack Hiles personally led to the Lord, even in his own fraudulent way. He was big on sending others, but he himself never went. Nice. Down here to David Cloud. I am a Hiles Anderson grad. And everything you said is right on the mark. Some of us truly uh, tried to believe, present the gospel clearly, but we had nowhere near the numbers the big boys did. If the Hiles and Grays and Neils and all the others who are having thousands saved presented salvation as a complete change of life, you know what the results would be. When I sat in the auditorium in Hammond for seven years, two degrees, I hardly ever saw anyone coming regularly who looked or acted like they were newly saved people. Oh, they might come once, but that was it. Let's face it, if they were having 15 to 20,000 baptisms a year, that wasn't so either, but that's another story. And only 1% were real and began attending. They would have needed to add seating for another 500 people every three years or so. It never happened. What a fantasy. All this panders to pride and arrogance, uh, which is the driving force behind all these matters. I could go on and on. Uh, I could go on and so could you, but for what? The deluded will never be convinced anyway. I think I would rather stand before God with a, fully, a futurely saved from my labors, from a multitude pointing the finger at me for confirming them in their unbelief. Very true. Next one here it says, uh, It is certain that Hiles Anderson for a long period of time did teach the heresy that repentance, repentance is not part of the gospel and many of their graduates have left there and taught this false gospel. Furthermore, when I was at Fairhaven Baptist Church in college, I saw firsthand instances where people from Hiles School were come to where we were. We had bus kids uh, go throughout the entire area, gimmick them to a Saturday church party, and baptize them all to count them as saved. Nice, you know. Um, it made me and my fellow bus workers very angry. Thankfully, they would then abandon them so that we 
so that we could continue to take uh, them to church and teach them the gospel of repentance and faith in Christ. There was one time that they did this in a project we picked kids up in, and they baptized practically everyone except for one kid who we picked up regularly. Uh, we asked this kid why he did not get baptized, and he told us that they had baptized him twice already, <laughs> and he did not want to get baptized again. Uh, he did not understand the gospel either, so he was not born again. Anyway, I say all this to say that I am in agreement with you about the soul-damning results of the Hiles-Anderson methodology and their former anti-repentance theology. Very true. Here we have another letter. It says, I am also one of those converts of Jack Hiles' bus ministry. Back in 1981, I was in the Navy station at Great Lakes NTC when approached by two men from Hiles' church. They whizzed me through the scriptures and kept asking, do you believe? I said, yes, out of politeness, but it was all so fast. It seemed like we went through the salvation plan in less than three minutes. Then all of a sudden we were, pray we were praying and I was told I was going to heaven. Wow. I felt like I had been dragged to, to salvation. I had no clue what I had just agreed to. I even went to the church and was baptized that Sunday. I don't even remember saying or agreeing I should do this, but I found myself in this long line of men being baptized. I remember saying to myself, you better get baptized and you would not want to hurt anyone's feelings. It was all at a very manic pace. Well, sure, you got to get the numbers in, don't you? Unreal. Down here, another letter, it says, something happened to him around 1968. He changed. He became obsessed, talking about Jack Hiles, with numbers and the people that were close to the Hiles children knew that things in the house, Hiles household were not what they should be. The cover-up was to begin. Down here, it says, Jack Scapp had has encouraged FBCH members church members to make Jack Hiles an idol. Besides the money, the church has blown with paintings on sides of buildings and statues that were made and disliked by the family. $300,000 out the door, by the way, only to be discarded and replaced with new ones at the church's expense. The church uh, bought Mrs. Jack Hiles a 2002 Jaguar to help um, her get over the natural grieving process of losing a husband and make her feel better. Isn't that nice? See if there's anything else here I'm going to read in these. And again, you can get on this, you know, website yourself and you can do the research and read all this if you want to. So, okay, that's it for the written part of this study and um, you know again I do have another article here which I'll be talking about as we go into the video but um, you know again you know all this stuff can be you know the, the testimonies and everything else you know would that be a very strong testimony in a court type of a situation no it wouldn't um, just written written people and there's no names there's no you know dates and things a lot of times what do you have there well you have kind of sketchy evidence but now we're going to go on to the really good evidence the very strong evidence here in the next part of this study and uh, that's going to be the video evidence and you aren't going to believe some of the stuff I found or rather the Lord showed me in this from their own information too by the way <laughs> 